Over to you, Adrienne. Thank you so much, Dr. McShane, and thank you all for inviting me today. I'm very excited to talk about this research project, which, as it turned out, was a very fun research project. Um, and I'll give you some context of how this project came about and, and who I am. So I'm a clinical psychologist, a psychotherapist, and uh, so primarily a clinician, um, and I've provided psychotherapy to, page, to patients with severe depression throughout my career in many different settings. And so, you know, listening for and constructing patient narratives is a large part of uh, what I do. Um, so I'm not a ketamine researcher, um, but my own research agenda, which I do at an academic medical center in, in Michigan in the United States, is chiefly around mental health services uh, interventions. So mental health services and intervention research. And it has some substantial qualitative components to it. Uh, so this was the context in which I was approached by another study team in my department, the BioK study team, um, to lead a qualitative study that was ancillary to the main BioK study. Um, BioK is a recently concluded uh, foresight, open label, single arm clinical trial in the United States that was designed to develop biomarkers of ketamine response in patients with treatment resistant depression, unipolar or bipolar major depression. What the BioK researchers realized in approaching me and, and my team was that they were kind of like sitting on this gold mine of possible qualitative data with their research participants. Um, and what they recognized and what they had a hunch about was that there was a story to be told about people who did well with ketamine, but also not just for them, but for the people who did not do well and whose ketamine treatment had failed. Now, um, before we go on to discussing the study, I wanted to mention a possible pitfall or controversy with our use of the term recovery. Um, in the United States, the term recovery often has a really specific meaning in psychiatry. It's usually defined in keeping with Bill Anthony's classic 1993 paper on recovery from severe and persistent mental illnesses like schizophrenia. And the way he defined it was recovery is, um, and this is a quote, the process in which people are able to live, work, learn, and participate fully in their communities and the development of new meaning and purpose in one's life as one grows beyond the catastrophic effects of mental illness. Now, this was not exactly what we meant when we used the term recovery. What we were doing was we were searching for a term that was distinct from the term remission, which we were already using to define specific cut points in the main depression outcome scale that we were using, the Madras scale. So we felt that the word recovery was a reasonable term to use for our purpose, was to, which was to capture kind of the more qualitative aspects of what remission might mean to somebody. And one referee of our paper, when it was under review, rightly pointed out that this may be confusing. Um, but we did end up using the word recovery, you know, despite the reviewer's objections, because we felt that other words like improvement, wellness, restoration, didn't really capture what we were trying to say as much as the word recovery, despite the connotations of the word recovery in our field. And moreover, we actually did believe on some level that our use of the term was true to Bill Anthony's original intention, which was to highlight the more subjective nature of what it means to get better uh, when you're when you're mentally ill beyond simply symptom reduction. So on to the study, I'm going to tell you about the study. Um, and I've been instructed by the organizers not to get too much into background in terms of ketamine treatment, which is good because you all are much more expert in terms of uh, ketamine treatment than, than I am. So instead, what I'll do is I'll provide background in terms of qualitative research methods and why they are used. Um, there are several things that qualitative research should not, cannot do. It really can to determine causation. It can't measure effectiveness. And it makes no specific claims about representativeness of the sample or statistical significance. It can't answer a question such as what proportion of people's depression remits after ketamine. Um, what qualitative aims and research can do is explore meanings, discover mechanisms, 
suggest not what, but why, uh, inform future research that may be quantitative in nature, and identify barriers and facilitators. So a possible quant qualitative question might be, what meanings do people ascribe to their recovery after ketamine treatment? And it's important to note also that the collection of a sample, that the goals are really different. For quantitative research, you collect a sample large enough to make a statistical inference. In qualitative research, it's different. You, you try to collect a sample that will lead to better understanding and variation. And there's a term called saturation, which is like the sense that you get once you're reading interview transcripts that you're kind of starting to see the same thing over and over again. That's the kind of like the sense you get when you've reached saturation. And that may take place with a small number of qualitative interviews or focus groups, if that's your methodology, or a large number, depending on how focused your aims are. So these were some key questions that we had when we uh, developed the project. How do patients with treatment-resistant depression understand and evaluate ketamine infusions in the context of having, quote unquote, failed conventional care? How do they describe its therapeutic effects? What's their understanding of how ketamine infusions can impact depression? And for those of them who had not recovered, why would this work for someone else and not you? And how can these narratives inform the clinical provision of IV ketamine for patients with treatment-resistant depression? So these were our aims uh, to characterize uh, patients' subjective experiences with receiving ketamine infusions, recovering or not recovering from treatment-resistant depression, and their beliefs about why ketamine worked or did not work. Um, and our hope was that characterizing these recovery and non-recovery narratives through these aims could help establish best practices for providers in framing expectations for patients seeking out ketamine for treatment-resistant depression, and also potentially for supporting your patients for whom it doesn't work. So this is the, the main biocase study um, so the, the larger sample from which we recruited our smaller sample. So the bio case study was age 18 to 65. They met DSM-5 MDD, bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 disorder. Um, their PHQ-9 score, which is a depression scale, had to be above 15 at baseline. And they had to be you know, operationally defined as treatment resistant, meaning the failure of at least two previous antidepressant uh, or mood stabilizing treatments at adequate dose and duration within the current depressive episode. Um, for those of you who are in ketamine practice, what I've been told about what the biocase study participants received is that they received ketamine infusions. It was either 100 minutes, 40 minutes, or mixed using a dose of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram to a maximum of 50 milligrams per infusion. And biocase Participants received three acute phase IV infusions delivered in an eight to 11 day period. So this was our, our subsample. Well, we referred to it as the TOC K study, study based on the bio K study. So this was our sample here. All 75 bio K participants were invited to participate. 21 actually did. This was 15 women and six men. It was not a diverse sample. It was 90% white, 10% African-American. The age range was 27 to 66. And there were there's a lot of variation when it came to time between BioK infusion and interviews, 11 months to 50 months. So that's an important factor to note when we're thinking through these narratives. Some are much fresher than others. 18 people, and so that was 86%, obtained further ketamine treatment after BioK infusions. Um, and then in terms of remission status, this was calculated based on Madras scores at a time point. Nine people were characterized as remitters, 12 as non-remitters. And from uh, the non-remitter sample, a greater than 50% score reduction was considered a partial remitter. Um, and that was that was three people. Um, our goal was to recruit only a subset of participants to gain a sample of qualitative experiences until we had saturation. So while all the study participants were invited to participate, we did discontinue recruitment um, after approximately 10 that were characterized as remitters and 10 non-remitters, roughly. Um, because it's often the case in qualitative research that you actually collect too much information and not uh, too little. 
and I will explain why in a few slides. So this was one of the things that caught our interest just preliminarily. You know, there were nine people who were considered remitters based on that Madras score. Then why would 18 people obtain further ketamine if only nine uh, were considered having achieved remission? You know, this is one of the things that kind of like piqued our interest at the, at the beginning when we were looking at um, our sample. Uh, even if you count these three partial remitters, that's it's still the case that it's 12 people who achieved some form of remission, whereas 18 got more in the community after the study was over. So th this was a, a couple of the interview questions we asked, you know, things like, can you describe your first experience um, during the ketamine infusions? Walk me through how the treatment has affected you over time, starting with right after, and what's your understanding of how ketamine works? Now, this was a semi-structured interview. What that means is that the, the questions were asked that were in the, the interview protocol, but the interviewers were permitted to ask questions not in the protocol. Um, and so because we wanted to be able to go down a rabbit hole and, you know, explore, you know, what these meanings meant to people and a semi-structured qualitative protocol really enables that to happen much more so than a fully structured one that doesn't permit any deviations. Um, we used Zoom automatic transcriptions to record um, we recorded the interviews and used Zoom for the transcriptions, and then we had a research assistant clean the, the transcriptions because, as you know, those are filled with errors so that the RA would have to like re-listen to the uh, interview and fix the transcripts for us before we went on and read them. And then all of us got a big stack of transcripts and had to code them. Um, and coding, I, I don't know if any of you are qualitative researchers, but this is like really what drives quantitative researchers crazy. I mean, it's so tedious and difficult. Um, and this is why a lot of quantitative researchers really want no part in this type of qualitative research because of the, the tediousness of the coding process. You know, we read all the transcripts, have initial discussions about the transcripts, develop a preliminary coding scheme based on the study aims and based on what we actually found in the transcripts, refine the coding scheme through this iterative independent coding of the same two transcripts, discuss the codes and code definitions, refine the coding scheme using new transcripts or are there new codes, are there not new codes, again discuss the codes until agreement is reached, rescore the first two transcripts with our new code book, Etc. I mean, the process just goes on and on. Um, you know, in the end, we had, um, you know, our code book set up and we were able to pull blocks of quotes in under the different code tags so that we could better understand the variety of experiences in this. Overall, we had um, 12 transcripts that were coded by more than one team member and nine that were coded by only one team member. And coded transcripts were examined by the entire coding team to derive themes and illustrative quotations connected to the study aims. Um, so these were some of the results. And I, I, I assume some of you or maybe even all of you are familiar with the paper. So I wanted to share with you some information that, that we gathered that wasn't necessarily in the paper as well, you know, some details and some quotes and things. One of the things we found was that people had these different theories of the mechanism of action for ketamine. Most people did have what we called a physical or a biological explanation for why the ketamine was working or not working. Five had more of almost an existential psychological sense, and one had like a mixed or a combination of the two. So I want to give you some examples of what people said that might fall under these categories. Um, so for expert experiential, Somebody said, uh, and this is a quote, um, you know, when you start talking about depression and people talk about breaking it down in our bodies, needing to be in deep rest, I think that in our current culture, in our society, we're so incredibly overwhelmed with all these things. You have to be the perfect mom. You have to have the perfect career. You have to be the perfect wife. And it's overwhelming. What I feel like the ketamine did was by dissociating it, it gave my brain a break that wasn't otherwise getting in any other part of my life and it forced that break. Like you're leaving the earth for an hour and then coming back. 
And so I think there was a lot of wisdom to that, just the ability to disconnect from all the pressures. So we characterize this as a primarily existential, psychological, experiential mechanism that the person had identified as the reason why ketamine was working for them. An example of the biological explanation was the person who said, I guess using an analogy, if something was plugged up in your brain, chemicals that weren't allowing the chemical, the chemicals, the serotonin or whatever else that's up there that makes you feel better, I was hoping that this medication would have given it a jolt and make it work again. So their, their explanation is kind of like mechanistic, biological, something is plugged, something related to serotonin is plugged up in your brain and this kind of like unplugs it. Um, so it was, it's just very interesting to, to hear people take on all of this. And my sense was that sometimes their take was based on whatever the researchers had told them. And sometimes they were kind of coming up with their own explanation as well. We also found that people had a particular sense of what ketamine's place was in their treatment trajectory. 13 people had very strong, like obvious sense of optimism and hope prior to treatment. They, they were, and they're, this is all retrospective. So they're just telling us what they remember, thinking a lot of optimism and hope. And the people for whom it worked expressed almost exuberance, you know, that this excitement that, that it was working. And for the people for whom it didn't work, really deep disappointment when they found out that it didn't work. So I'll, I'll, um, read you an example quote from a remitter. They said, I felt shock and disbelief, like distrust. Is this going to last? For me, it was such a drastic change from feeling so depressed and suicidal to not, that after being in the first camp for so long, it was hard for me to believe that this could be real. And not like I was, oh, I'm not in reality, but like, this is really going to last, that this is really going to work. So they were just almost in shock that, that something had actually really helped them. You know, contrast that to somebody who said, they told me um, that it would open new pathways up in my brain. And so that's what I was expecting to happen. I felt so disappointed that it just didn't do anything for me, that it made me feel really kind of very negative. Just like the ECT and the magnet therapy, I was extremely disappointed afterwards when it didn't work. Um, and I want to point out that there were people who were interviewing who were actually tearful and crying when they were talking about their disappointment um, for this not working after a long chain of, of failed treatments. Um, another thing people talked about a lot was any sort of remarkable or noteworthy experience during the infusions themselves. So 12 people had a, either a dissociative or a psychedelic-like experience during the infusions. 12, not, this, not necessarily the same, the same 12, reported um, existential insights. Um, all of them reported something to do with the milieu. So they all kind of commented on the milieu in some way. We started asking people whether talking to staff might help or might interfere somehow with the progress that they were experiencing. Eight people said they didn't want to talk to staff. They just wanted to feel it and not have anyone talk to them and bother them. Seven people said they thought they would actually benefit from some sort of structured discussion with a staff member about what they were feeling. And six were neutral or equivocal where they weren't sure um, whether it would help or not. Um, one thing I wanted to say, which we didn't talk a lot about in the paper was that existential insights, I mean, that's something that sounds like it would mostly be a good thing to have an ex as existential insight, but there was one person in particular who had a very negative existential insight. And I wanted to read part of the quote to you. Um, the person said, I remember making the observation um, that I was at the bottom level of existence where everything within me and outside of me seemed very mechanical and being alive felt like being a mechanism or a machine. And it reminded me of watching an ant farm and these very busy ants and all they're really doing is going through the motions. I felt machine-like, but I remember that uh, name of provider and others asking me if I felt an out-of-body experience and I wouldn't experience it as, as literally out-of-body, but I would describe it as a feeling sort of existentially detached and feeling like I was really sort of a machine. Ants are very studious and it's very important to them. They have all these values to get the grains of sugar from one place to another. 
But when you watch the ant farm, it looks rather absurd and they're really just going in a circle. And that on ketamine during the infusions and with the oral trochees that was later um, has been the experience for me, not only my own existence, but my conception of all existence, that it's not very meaningful. <laughs> so I thought that was a you know pretty fascinating uh, quote. Um, another thing that struck us when we were looking at this data was that <clears throat> only five people had a primarily existential or experiential mechanism of action for the ketamine, but 12 had some kind of, kind of existential insight during the process, which means that there are a lot of people who really don't ascribe like the, <clears throat> like the reason ketamine might be working to the existential insight, um, but still have them. Um, and, you know, there's probably ways as a clinician to make it more meaningful for people. So uh, another kind of interesting result we found was that uh, of the 12 participants defined by the MADRAS score as being in the non-remission group, five could be characterized as having full or partial recovery based on their narrative. So, you know, as, a, as coders, we were looking at like, what does this narrative tell us about whether the person has recovered or not? So there were a number of people who really seemed like they should be or could be remitters based on what we were reading about their lives, um, but weren't characterized that way based on the Madras score, which admittedly was at one time point. Um, so for example, I'm gonna read you a quote and you can think about whether you would characterize this person as someone who achieved recovery or remission. The person said, I found it was working. I have since gone off my anxiety meds completely. And you know, it's not a magic wand. It doesn't change everything, but I have definitely noticed an improvement in my generalized anxiety and my moods. So I have pursued ketamine for treatment. So this is actually a person who was considered a non-remitter uh, using the Madras cut points. Uh, here's another one. It didn't help as much as I had hoped. I think at the time I really had the sense that like some people had a couple of infusions and they were like way better forever. And that is not what happened to me, but it did make a really marked improvement and functioning and be able to do things again. So it, it seems like for this person, it, it, they're characterizing it as something that was not perfect, but that did help. And the, the madras would say they were a, a non-remitter. So I, uh, I'm going to close by sharing with you just some impressions and ideas. So I, the, the organizers told me I was free to uh, be a little bit more speculative and go like a little bit outside the data when I'm discussing this with you. And I'm, I'm happy to kind of continue the conversation in the latter part of, of this hour. But th these are some impressions and ideas and quantitative research questions that I have based on my experiences doing this study. So my first impression or idea is that a biological versus existential understanding of ketamine's mechanism of action may impact how the recovery process is understood by patients. And so a possible research question is, do people with a biological versus existential understanding engage in more powerlessness type cognitions versus self-blame cognitions after a failed treatment? So if they think they have like a, a so-called broken brain, and that's kind of outside their control um, because it's a purely biological thing. Are they feeling powerless? If they have a more psychological or existential explanation, are they blaming themselves for their lack of recovery for just not being insightful enough, for example? So a question without an answer right now. Um, another impression is after a depression is characterized as treatment resistant, adding another failed treatment poses, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, poses some psychological risks to the person. So adding that one more failed treatment, one more disappointment does pose some risks outside of what would be more, a more medically oriented risk of a treatment such as a cardiac side effect or something like that. And that should be weighed when considering whether to initiate interventional psychiatric care like, like ketamine or, or TMS. And a possible quantitative research question here would be, do patients experience significantly more hopelessness after an interventional psychiatric treatment, which seems more radical to people in their minds, as opposed to like yet another oral medication trial? And does hopelessness intensify after a certain number of failed treatments? And at what point? Like, do we see like a certain, like an uptick of hopelessness after X number of treatments have been attempted? Um, 
Another impression is depression scales are necessary for research and for measurement-based care, yet seem not to capture a range, of, a range of recovery outcomes made possible by ketamine and other treatments. So questions might be, how do we fully capture outcomes of interest? Um, how do we do it inexpensively? <laughs> because as you saw from the coding process, it, it is quite involved. Um, and it's not necessarily practical to, to have something like that be a piece of every study. Um, at what level of symptom reduction, uh, what level of symptom reduction is necessary, if any, um, to achieving the clinical outcomes that we want? Like, for example, rejoining their community, feeling connected, feeling a sense of purpose. How much do you have to reduce symptoms in order to achieve that, if at all? Um, and among people who are not getting better based on the scale measurements, what differentiates those who subjectively feel better and those who do not? So um, that is all that I have for you, and I'm, I'm happy to move on to the uh, Q&A at, at this point. Well, thank you, Adrian. That's a fantastic sort of basis, I think, for uh, um, I mean, an enormous amount of work. I mean, you shouldn't underestimate that, <laughs> even though, you know, it's a sample of 21, but, you know, just the, the, the sheer grind of getting through all those scripts, I, I, I don't envy you. <laughs> um, it's, you know, I expect you wondered at the end of it, why, why do we do this to ourselves? You know? um, but anyway, um, so let's uh, go through the questions that people have put in the chat first. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, interest here. We've got a good turnout. So um, I think we'll, we'll just go through these quite quickly um, and then we can come to uh, come to the discussion. Um, so um, what will pay, what you, you alluded to what the um, influence of uh, what the uh, the, how the patient's perception of mechanism was determined by what clinicians had told them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you say anything more about that? What, what were the patients told in this study? So what my understanding is from the BioK part of the study, which I was not directly involved with, was that patients were told that this was an experimental depression treatment, that it was promising, and that the purpose of the study was to discover biomarkers of ketamine response, that they may or may not have a ketamine response to it. So it, it was, it did vary a little bit from site to site exactly what the PI said to patients about what to expect, because it was a fairly clinical setting. So it was more similar to walking into a clinic and talking to a doctor about, you know, what's about to happen. So everyone had kind of their own style in terms of what exactly they said. Okay. My guess is that it was primarily biologically oriented, the explanation, especially since this is in the context of a biomarkers study. <clears throat> um, I don't know if, if uh, Dr. Preek is able to weigh in because he would know a lot more about the details of what was said. Um, but would you like to would you like to say more about how that was framed, Dr. Preek? Uh, yeah, I, that, I think that's uh, quite accurate. Uh, people were told that this is an experimental treatment, uh, but and we did not go into mechanisms that uh, at all. Did, did did you have people state their goals of treatment prior to treatment? Uh, no, 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 we didn't uh, because this we we said that we're only going to give you three infusions. And we understand that as a treatment, often people need more than three. But our understanding of the field was that if you were going to become a responder, usually it showed up by uh, the time you had had three infusions. So our, uh, we were very clear on the fact that we were not delivering a full treatment, but that you were participating in a biomarker study. Uh, and, you know, hopefully it was helpful from a treatment perspective. But this was not a full treatment by any means. And they were on anti other antidepressants as well, were they, when the ketamine was administered? Uh, this, was, this was open, uh, that, that is, they could be unmedicated or they could be medicated, but almost everyone was on something. Okay, good. Um, so yes, you, you, um, Adrian, you raised a, 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 a good question for us. Uh, um, at the end there about, about about the outcomes that we could potentially use to try and 
track meaning, purpose and connectedness. And this is the sort of group where usually somebody knows something about that. Um, so if anybody has got any good instruments that they uh, use for these things, please just put them in the chat uh, and um, then we can come to those later. Um, uh, and I will say in my own clinical work, I, I'm always on the lookout for things of this nature. It's not really used. We have some functional outcomes in our measurement-based care in our clinics. Those tend to move very slowly, if at all. Um, the symptoms tend to move more. Um, but if you look at certain theoretical orientations to psychotherapies, it's certainly the umbrella of recovery, but also I, I think in the UK, acceptance and commitment therapy is somewhat um, popular. And so they don't see the clinical outcomes as primary that, you know, symptom reduction. They see it more about, you know, are you living the kind of life you want to live according to your values? So there's certainly ways to do it. I don't know if there's ways that are very pragmatic in the context of measurement-based care um, or research. Do you think, do you know if the individual with a negative experience, do you know if the individual with a negative experiential report did better as a result of ketamine infusions or not? That person was characterized as a partial remitter, meaning that they they didn't meet their emission cut point, um, but their scores did improve and the person did go on and seek out more ketamine. Not, as far as I know, it wasn't IV ketamine though. I think it was the oral trochees, but I yeah, can't remember you're, the details. You alluded to that. Can you say a little bit about that for, for, for the audience, about how, about, you know, what the trajectory of treatment was uh, afterwards? And, and, and also the, the fact that you had this year gap before you started interviewing people about it. So it was quite a long time ago, wasn't it? It was. You know, the, the, the qualitative study came about close to the end of the main bio study, which is why you see that huge variation in the number of months. So it was very much a retrospective interview. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after their relatively brief time with bio they were free to go out in the community and seek out whatever care they pleased. And for many of them, that involved continuing to pursue ketamine despite the great expense to them. Um, so, so, so I could add something yeah, here too. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Right. Uh, so um, because we knew that we were not giving a full ketamine treatment, we uh, you know anticipated, and many of these were patients at our own clinics, of course, that we would uh, of course have to provide other treatments afterwards, and the options included you know just a standard like go to some other treatment, or if ketamine was working, you know continue ketamine either IV or oral because we are uh, quite comfortable and familiar with using an oral form of a, uh, a dissolving uh, pill known as a trochee here. That's the term used here that dissolves in your mouth. So it's not actually uh, swallowed. And part of the reason why we even decided to do the, bio, the, the talk case study, the qualitative component, is that we had our own impression of how people were doing uh, at the end of the three infusions. And it was interesting that we were seeing that some people who didn't have uh, a full remission clearly had some movement and wanted more. And so we thought, well, let's, you know, there's something there to talk about or to understand about. And this, this was, you know, where just natural clinical observation led to a question. And that's why the, the talk case study was not planned at the start of the bio case study. You know, we were strictly a, doing it for biomarker purposes, but we were realizing that all sorts of trajectories were happening. And therefore, uh, we said, uh, we need to pull in a qualitative researcher. And that's why I invited Adrian to, to help us understand this. Okay, thanks. And, and just to understand, the, I mean, I think it's a great strength of this work, isn't it, that you've got this long-term perspective on, on it, so people can look back and um, they can say, but but your your definition of responders and, and and so forth that was was that based on how they were at eleven months or how they were at the end of their three infusions. Three infusions. 
that was at the end of the three infusions. Okay. Yeah. So, so you you sort of did did you decide not to interview them about their subsequent experience? Were you deliberately trying to exclude that experience, or was that part of what you were examining? That's a really good question. So we actually we limited the detailed inquiry in the interview guide to the bio case study. We basically said we want you to think back because this was everyone's. Nobody had had prior ketamine, so. Mm -hmm. This was everybody's first experience with ketamine treatment. So we were asking them to delve into what that was like. And then we did also collect some information about what happened next. Did you seek out more ketamine? What was your treatment like? Um, and so the, the focus of the experience, the, the part where we were really asking them to delve into what it was like for them and why they think it, it worked was those three first infusions. But we did get information about what happened next. It was very interesting. One person said it, it actually, it helped her psychotherapy. She felt like it caused things to kind of like move in terms of her understanding of herself that allowed her to apply that and get more out of therapy than she had gotten out of it before. And again, that's a very, I mean, we hope that also led to symptom reduction, but that outcome is not symptom-based. That's more, you know, I felt things were moving better. I was getting more out of treatment. But that was only only one out of the 20, the 21. Yeah, th that specifically said that, you know, if we had had an item on the semi-structured interview that said, tell us about how this affected your psychotherapy, we might have gotten more. But sure. some of it just flowed from what well, we had, so, you know. So sort of re <clears throat> relatedly, was there was there a relationship between the patients who wanted to talk to experimenters during their treatment and their perception of mechanism and that or outcome? Or was that not something that you looked at, given the numbers? Yeah, so so we so we're not able to answer that question in terms of like correlation, you know, because it's too small a sample size to say if you did this, you're more likely to do this. So we we can't answer it in that sense. What what we can say is that within the context of the narratives, it seemed that the people with this more existential explanation for why ketamine was working for them also kind of used that explanation for lots of mental health things. You know, they were also kind of, you know, not describing depression in a particularly biological way. Um, but we can't say, you know, I don't think it would have been a, a good idea for us to try to analyze it from the point of view of if you say this, are you more likely to say that? Because it's really too few people and that's trying to force the qualitative data into a more quantitative question yeah yeah and we've got a challenge here from from scott smith who says if we are scientists utilizing the scientific method to evaluate the usefulness of ketamine as treatment for depression why does a patient's satisfaction or opinion about the mechanism of action of ketamine matter i think that's a great question and i think it speaks to to what this data can and can't do so i would say the reason that it that it matters is that if people think that there's something about the way they're understanding their life that impacts their mental health overall, then something like a psychotherapy could make a difference. Um, and so how, how people are framing this whole process might matter in terms of what kind of treatment they pursue later or whether they take advantage of, you know, let's say a relationship or a spiritual experience or whatever to improve the quality of their lives down the line. And, you know, furthermore, I think that, you know, we, we were looking at some interesting data from another study that looked at um, the, the psychedelic-like or dissociative experience during the infusion which said that is really not necessary to achieving results. You can get better after a ketamine infusion without any sort of dissociation or psychedelic-like experience. It can still help. If people think that that is necessary to getting better, they might think, oh, well, this treatment didn't work because I didn't have a weird experience uh, during my infusion. So I, th I think it kind of actually goes both ways. You know, we have to reassure people you don't need to have that kind of existential psychedelic thing happen to you for this to help you. But on the other hand, if it does happen, you know, why not use that as instructive to improve the quality of your life? 
if, if I if I could just add one point, that is that one of the strongest predictors of outcome, both in pharmacotherapy and in psychotherapy, is the therapeutic alliance. And part of the therapeutic alliance is having shared goals and a shared understanding of the problem and a shared understanding of what we hope the treatment will do. So understanding where the patient is at, as well as where we're at in terms of our putative mechanisms and our, our plan for intervention will, will shape the therapeutic alliance and ultimately shape the outcome. You know, this is a cheeky question, but was this in your biomarker study of predictors, the therapeutic alliance? Well, uh, you know, this is, this is in our study of, gee, I wish I had thought of that earlier. Of course, yeah, okay. Um, uh, interesting question here is why, why if people failed their treatment, were they motivated to participate in the follow-up study? I love that question. And we were really hoping that people who failed their treatment would participate. We were very interested in learning from them. And so we, we made it very clear in all of our recruitment flyers and information and things like that. And when we were talking to people that we want to hear from you, we would love to hear from you. Um, we did have a small participation incentive. You know, there was a, a dollar amount, but I think that actually was not that motivating for people. I think people wanted to tell their stories and were, were happy to. Most people were talking very kind of freely with the interviewers. A couple of people were, were very brief and short in their uh, responses and seemed to be just trying to get through it. But that was a small minority of, of our sample.